Thank you for that, Pastor. I appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity. Can you believe that we've been in this campus for a year now? A year ago yesterday, we had our first service here. It felt like we've been here for way longer than that. I don't know if that's just me or not. But since we've got here, we've faced tricks and devices and attacks of the enemy that we've never experienced before. And each one seems a little bit different every time. Each one seems newer and harder and tougher to get past. But tonight I'm actually going to unveil another trick that I found that the devil is using against God's people. And the title of my message tonight is The Oldest Trick in the Book. My first scripture I'd like to bring up is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not to be ignorant of his devices, and we shouldn't be. Every device is different, but it's the same at the same time, if that makes any sense. (laughs) That word devices in the Greek means mental perception or thought. He comes after our minds first. Each mind trick is different. Each mind trick is new. The further we get in God, the the more trickier the, the devices get. The tougher it is for us to notice, the more back doors he tries to sneak through. So the oldest trick in the book, I'm actually going to bring us back to the book of Genesis. Shocker, right? (laughs) I want to start with Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord said, it is not good for man that man should be alone. I will send him Uh, Send him help meet for him. So God's setting up a foreshadowing. He created man, and he doesn't want him to be alone. And we know that this is a type and a shadow of the bride of Christ and the church. So if we go to verses 21, starting at verse 21. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he brought and made a woman and brought her unto the man. Next verse. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we know that this is a setup as a type and a shadow how God is going to take the bride out of the church as a whole, the smallest portion out of the, ch- out of the body as a whole. And he created a bride from that smallest portion to the man called Adam. Since the beginning, I'm going to submit to you that the devil's aim of deception and seduction is at the bride. Let's look at chapter 3 and verse 1 of Genesis. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and the Lord God had, that the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath, yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. Since the beginning, the serpent has twisted the words of God to make it sound a little different, to make it sound a little appealing, some may say. See, he asked Eve a question, and the first mistake that she made was that she indulged in conversation with him. She didn't just walk past him and say, leave me alone, I know better. She indulged in the conversation with him. She continued. The conversation continues in the, in the coming verses where she's talking to him, and he's seducing her. He's, he's twisting the words that God spoke from his very mouth to deceive her. And let's look at verse 13. And God asks her a question. After all it had come, come to pass and they had eaten of the fruit. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. That word beguiled means to mentally lead astray. To delude or seduce. Since the beginning of time, the enemy has tried to come against the bride first. That is his target, and that's who he's going after. 
there's a new type of deception that's going around. I've, unfortunately, I'll be vulnerable. I've fallen victim to it. And I know many others have fallen victim. And I'm upset about it because it's dared to crawl into my house and torture people that I love and I care about. And the new deception is about of the anxiety of Jesus' return. Twisting God's word to convince bridal candidates that they're not good enough. The world has turned that phrase not good enough and romanticized it and made it sound appealing. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. I, I can't. I'm not going in the rapture. I did all this and I'm not doing this. And I'm sick of it. <laughs> Let me tell you the difference between conviction that is from God and condemnation that is from the devil. I'll tell you the difference, and it was, it got to listen carefully because they sound similar, and I'll say it twice if I have to. But there's a huge difference, and if you're jotting it down, I urge you to jot it down because God revealed it to me, and it was earth-shattering. Conviction is when God tells you of something that needs to be corrected. And condemnation is when the devil tells you everything that you're doing wrong. You're not doing this correctly. You're not doing that correctly. You're, you're, not, you're doing this too much when you shouldn't be. That's not how that works. That's the difference. The devil tells you everything you're doing wrong, and God tells you what needs to be corrected. His goal with this new tactic of causing us to be anxious and fearful and and pent up with Jesus's return is to get us deceived into the sickbed. Because if he can't do it physically and he can't deceive us about our bridegroom because we know he can deceive us about ourselves, that we aren't eligible to make it. John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have come that they might have life and that they might have life, may have it more abundantly. He's come to steal your place in the bride. He's come to try to kill you off and destroy any chances that you may have in it by trying to convince you that what you're doing and what you're not doing is going to take you out, keep you out from making the rapture. He's done whatever it takes to get that bride off track. He's done it since the beginning and he's going to keep doing it. I've fallen victim to this. Some of us have even devised plans of what we're going to do if we get left behind. I've fallen, I've fallen victim of it, unfortunately. I've had fear and anxiety. I actually watched the video of the signing of the Abraham Accord at my lunch break once. And I, at first I was really excited, and then I got really, really anxious. And I got really, really afraid, and I couldn't concentrate on my work. And that's not how God wants us to live our lives about his return. His return is a joyous occasion. It's something we should be looking forward to, not shaking in our boots concerned. When is it going to happen? When am I going to miss it? Am I going to miss it? Am I not good enough for this? First Peter 5 and 8. We know this verse, we can quote it. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. When we choose, we allow him to devour us when we give in to those thoughts. When we have that conversation with him, we're allowing him to devour us. That word devour, that the number actually is probably not an accident, but the number is G2666. Coincidence? I don't think so. It means to swallow up and to destroy. His goal is to sed seduce and deceive the bride into the bed by agreeing with his lies. Let me give you a little like visual concept of what that looks like. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm not doing this correctly. I'm not doing that correctly. I'm not doing this enough. And before you know it, you're in the sick bed. And that's where he wants you. That's where he can devour you. You're helpless. You're not moving. You're not, de you're not defending yourself. You're not defending others. That's where he wants us to be, in the fetal position, scared, afraid, anxious. He knows that the outright, outright attacks that he places on us, they're obvious, we know how to ward them off. We know how to stop them. We know how to pray. We know how, we know how to do all that. But the deception of the mind, that's a little more subtle. Comes in through the back door. 
So we looked at the beginning of the book. Let's look at the back of the book. In, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. This is a depiction of an end time event that's already occurred. And it draws a picture of the bride, the devil, and the church. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. And he did cast them to earth. So that's devil and all his minions. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the, the, the woman is a representation of the church, and the man child that she's about to give birth to is a representation of the bride. He's standing there ready, licking his chops, ready to try to get that that man child that's coming out he knows it's coming he can feel it the bible says that all creation groans for the the revealing of the bride so he knows it's happening he feels the reverberations in the spirit he knows he's ready that word dragon means great serpent mirrored at the beginning of the book and at the back of the book go on to the next verse and she brought forth the man child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron And her child was caught up unto God and unto his throne. The devil tries to get the bride because the bride has a special position that he never had a chance to get to. He try, he's jealous, he's mad, and he wants everything he can do to get at that bride that's about to come and about to be revealed. This word devour is something a little bit different in this passage. It means to consume by eating or the consumption of the strength of the body and mind by strong emotions. He goes after the mind, and then he goes after the emotions. We have emotions, nothing's wrong with them, but if we allow them to be handed over to the devil, then it becomes a problem. We become sitting ducks for when he wants to deceive us and destroy us, and to steal and to kill and to destroy Paul recants the story in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. He says, for that which... Mm, I'm sorry, I don't know if that's correct. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity uh, that is Christ. As he beguiled Eve, should we be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ? You know how simple it is? It's really simple. We should know this verse. It's Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's no fine print that says except except, um, if you're doing this or you're not doing this or you're not following these directions if you're not doing that. You seek his kingdom first and then everything else will fall into place after that. Don't listen to the little lies that are telling you in the back of your head that you're not good enough. Or even bringing up the things of the past. Like, those things are gone and done with. Let them go. That doesn't belong there. So recognize the deceit that it, for what it is and rebuke it and move on. Here's how to combat the seduction and the deception and the not good enough feeling. Because God picked us up from where we are were and strategically placed us in this church. If he did not think we were good enough, we would not be here. We would not be here underneath a pastor who seeks the revelation of God and, and, and bestows it onto us and encourages us to do so. We could be at any Laodicean church right now worried about the election next, in the next couple of months. That's not what God had planned for us. He put us here, where we have the secret power, where we have these revelations being poured out. The parable that Jesus preached about the virgins, they said that they had lamps with oil of revelation. I was thinking the other day, I'm like, we need more than lamps. We need buckets to carry our oil in because we got so much. (laughs) We have so much that we aren't willing to give to anybody else. Here's how to combat the seduction and the deception and the not good enough feeling that the devil tries to attack our minds with. James 4 and 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's a formula. Submission first, plus resistance, 
then he will flee from you. That, it's easy as that. Brother Nate, would you come? And the last verse I'd like to bring to you, we should all know also, is 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Remember who you are as a child of God. As a bridal candidate of Christ, get up out of that sickbed and don't let him keep coming at you with these thoughts of fear and anxiety and depression and not feeling good enough because he chose us for this place and this time, and he chose us to be his bride. I asked God, I was, How does, what does this have to do with revival? And he said, revival of awareness. Awareness of who we are and whose we are. Yes. And awareness of the attacks of the enemy that like to try to slip in on the sides that we don't notice. That we fall, fall into so easily. Please stand together. If you've fallen victim of this, as I have, you don't have to raise your hand. God knows and you know. Give it over to him and remind the devil where he belongs. You read the back of the book and he loses and we win. So remind him of that. And while you're at it, you might as well just remind him of his future while you're at it. So I ask that each one of you would take a moment and evaluate yourselves and just give it over to God and let the devil have it. Uh. <laughs> let him have it. <laughs> Remind him who you belong to and who you're about to marry, who you're engaged to. Thank you, Pastor and Pastor Linda and church family. Oh, God, you are so faithful. You are so faithful. Thank you for meeting us in this house and for your presence that's that's just diving into our innermost being, God, and showing us who you are. Thank you for your glory, and thank you for the spirit of conviction and correction and everything that you're doing in this house already, God. Continue to do the work and speak through me that I would be able to speak what it is that you've given to me and placed on my heart. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so apparently, well, two things that, that are apparent. God likes to use my experiences for sermons, which is super fun. And also, a bunch of people probably need to hear this because it's going to be the third time tonight. So I'm going to call them rapture drills, too. I've been trying to figure out what else to call them besides rapture scare. But for this particular time, I'm going to call it a scare. So we had like a, a couple, a week or so of insight into when the rapture might have taken place, right? And so because we had that insight, I was like, okay, I'm pretty good. I feel like I'm pretty solid. I'm probably going to make it. It'll be all right. And then as the time went on, I started getting kind of dowdy. I'm like, oh, well... I don't do X, Y, Z, well, or X and Y. And <laughs> I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I do this too much, and blah, 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 and things that Drew was saying. And then the night before, on Saturday night, Drew and I finished our prayer time, as we always pray before bed, and af right after the prayer, we said amen, and I just fell apart. I've not had a panic attack in a number of years, and this was like the worst one I've had. My ears went um, clogged up, I couldn't hear anything, my sinuses clogged, my vision went blurry. I was physically under a panic attack totally from the enemy, sobbing, I'm not gonna make it, and Sarah Joy's gonna stay here because of me, and I'm a horrible mom. And it took like a good couple hours for Drew and I to like break through this. It would come in waves and I was just, I wasn't even afraid because I, I guess I'm a mom, but I wasn't even afraid so much of myself staying. It was being a reason why someone else would have to. And that's kind of the precursor to this message. 
So today, I, God has been dealing with me with this for a while, and I didn't want to preach on this because I did not want to be vulnerable because I'm a reverend, and I should totally not have been afraid of the rapture. But here we are. Jesus is having me do it anyway. So I went to scripture. Like, okay, where in scripture was anybody else afraid of what might have been happening? So I, I took a search and came across 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1. And Paul's writing these letters to the church of Thessalonica. And this is the second chapter of that letter. And he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, could you go to verse 2? I'm so sorry. That ye not be soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So I looked up that last little line, because we read that in scripture a lot, that the day of the Lord is at hand. It means that, um, it can mean two things. The day of the Lord is coming, or that the day of the Lord has already happened. So Paul is saying here, don't be afraid, guys. So clearly, this church, this, this people group, they were losing their minds. They were shaken in mind. They were troubled in their spirit. They were troubled by words to each other, by letters that Paul was sending. They were freaking out. So, like, that was comforting for me. Like, oh, I was not the only one. Thank you, Jesus. Who was good. So Paul had to calm these people down and say, like, take a chill pill, guys. It's going to be all right. Jesus didn't come yet, so there's still time. Exhale. And then in the previous letter that he sent to them, he was talking to them. Um, actually, we'll go there. Go ahead and go to 1 Thessalonians 4 and 18. Because this is what pastor said. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The, the return of the Lord, Jesus calling us home, like Pastor said, is meant to be a comfort. If you're not comforted by that, either you're under attack of the enemy or Jesus is trying to show you something that you need to correct. Jesus also anticipated that there might be some unnecessary fear around his calling us home. And he addressed that in Luke chapter 12, verses 31 through 32. This is another account of him telling us to seek the kingdom of God and that all these things shall be added unto us. But what's here in verse 32, we don't see in Matthew. Fear not, little flock. Don't be afraid. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants us to make the bride. He wants us to experience the pleasures of the kingdom. So he gives us tools and everything that we need to be able to access that because he wants it for us. He doesn't want to make things too hard and too complicated for us to not be able to do it. That was not his plan. If it was, he would have been like, mm, guys, if you can't follow this list, too bad. I don't know what to do for you. He said, don't be afraid. And I love that he says little flock because it's like, oh, you guys are so cute little humans. Don't be scared. <laughs> Jesus wants to give this to you. He gave you all these things, and all he really he said was to seek my kingdom. Seek my kingdom, and everything else is going to fall into place, like, like Drew said. So this experience revealed a lot of opportunities, areas, areas of opportunities to many of us, myself included. Many people felt rushed to remedy some of the choices they're making. Um, they, they felt rushed to enhance their prayer life. Okay, I've got to just sit in my prayer closet, call out of work, don't do anything else, don't answer texts, just don't eat, pray in my closet, rock back and forth, because that's the only way I'm going to make it, because he's coming on Sunday. And I'm not the only one, because there's nervous laughter. <laughs> Other people are like, oh, I've got to study. I'm calling off of work for that, too. Pull up Blue Letter Bible. Got my new King James, my King James, all of the things. Cross-reference. I'm just going to read till my eyes pop out of my head. Just till Sunday, because that's when the rapture comes. <laughs> and whether or not you actually did those things, those are signs to us that Jesus was trying to show us 
these areas of opportunity. All joking aside, if you aren't praying enough, if this experience showed you that you need to be praying more, go ahead and do it. If this experience showed you that you need to be in your studying more, to study, to show yourself approved, do that. Go right ahead and do that. We've been reminded in this experience that while we don't know the day or the hour, we are absolutely called to watch, pray, and be ready for when that day does come. So what do we do with what we've got now? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the kingdom everlasting of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the very first thing that we should do that I did was I took a serious look. Is my calling an election Sure. And I feel like that's what God is calling us to do in lieu of this experience. In this a aftermath, if you will, take a serious, hard look. Have I made my calling and election sure? And what am I doing to prove it, that it's sure? God doesn't just want our lip service. He wants our hands to work at what we say. He's always been a God of action. He's always been a God of action. So after you take your time and you make your calling and election sure, and remember you have free will, so you don't have to, but you definitely should. Then we can go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil. So I took a look at that word circumspectly. It's G199 and it's akribos and it means exactly or diligently. So walk after you've made your election sure, walk accordingly to that and walk diligently in it. Don't take breaks. Don't fall to the wayside of it, but walk diligently, circumspectly in the decision that you made and hold yourself accountable to that. We're all filled with the Holy Ghost in this space. So the Holy Ghost can hold us accountable to the decisions that we've made. And then he says to redeem the time because the days are evil. Make use of the time diligently while you're walking. It's not the time to mess around. The days are evil. The days are evil. I realize you guys can't see me pointing over there. The days are evil. So we have to redeem the time. Take back the time. Yeah. Take back the time. You're spending too much time on your social media. Take back that time and put your phone down. You're not praying enough? Do what you need to do to get into your prayer closet, your secret space with just you and God, and get in on it. I know that we have day-to-days, -day and we have lives, and we're supposed to live here even though we're not of here, but there is no excuse to not spend time with your bridegroom. There is no excuse to not spend time with your bridegroom. And that's, that's the one thing that I learned in this experience God opened my eyes to, even though I'm doing what I thought was bare minimum, God wants so much more from us because he loves us. Because he wants to marry us. So take back the, your time. Take back the time. Don't just binge watch on Netflix or Disney or Hulu or any of those things. Binge watch Jesus. Binge watch his re possible return. Don't get caught up in the politics. But the way you binge watch Jesus is reading his word. Oh, I've never done that before. Oh, I'm holding up the Bible. Praise God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll start in verse 10. 
For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. God doesn't forget our work. And we're called not to be slothful with our hands. Go ahead and go to the next um, verse. Be not slothful, but followers of them who through the faith and patience inherit the promises. And we'll stop there. Don't be slothful. Here we're told to work. So the title of my message tonight, even though we're called to watch and pray, it's called Watch and Work. We're watching for the return of Jesus, but our hands are going to be busy while we're doing it. We're going to be working at what he called us to work at in ministry to one another and how we love one another and how we go about our daily lives. We're going to work at it. And finally, we'll go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet and do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. And we'll stop there. We're called to this church that Paul was talking to. He literally told them, you guys are doing a great job loving each other. I don't even have to address it. But I want you to do it more. This church, we're great at brotherly love. We hold one another up. We love each other deeply. We would lay down our lives for our friends. But I feel like even with all the other things that God is calling us to do and the corrections in our personal lives, let's love each other even more than we already do. He also encourages this group of people to be quiet and work in what we've been given to work with. Linda has a saying where she says, mouths closed, hands busy. And it's so important in the time that we're in not to backbite, not to dwell in. What we say with our mouths, we speak from the inward of our heart. So what we're saying in our mouths, that's what we're thinking. That's what we're feeling. And while we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, we're not meant to pull the other person into ours. Speak honestly to each other. Speak the truth in love. Being quiet doesn't necessarily have to mean that you keep yourself shut down. It just means that you're, you're focused on what you're doing. And you're focused on what God has called you to do in your own area, whatever that is. Staying in your lane. There is so much work to be done. And we know that because Jesus hasn't called us home yet. If he had called us home on Sunday, our training period would be over. But God thinks, he must think, that we need a little bit more training. And that's okay. But we have to go through training diligently, focused on it, and not lose sight of the goal, which is to make it as a bride. And the last scripture, I forgot, sorry. Psalm 91 and verse 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Above all else, we love each other. We love the return of Jesus because we have our love set upon him. We're so focused on loving Jesus. He's going to deliver us. The bride is not appointed to wrath. 
He will set us on high because we've known his name. That word known is, it's encompassed. It's intimately known, not just an acquaintance. And so what I hope that you take away from this is that we love each other. We do the work and the things that God brought to our attention in our rapture drill. Do those things. Don't give up on those things. Don't lose the fire of doing those things. Live every single day as if he's coming right now. And make your choices accordingly. Love each other. Work while you watch. And continue to love his return. Set your love upon him. Seek his kingdom first and all of these things will be added unto you. He's so faithful. He's so faithful. And he's so loving to give us the time that we need so that we can all make it. Because he wants us to be part of his